Troubleshooting electrical problems can be a real pain in the ass. But that's unless, of course, you have a strong foundation in electrical fundamentals. And that's the topic of this edition of The Trainer. Diagnosing electrical faults is one of the biggest challenges that most technicians seem to face. Maybe it's because they don't quite understand it. They can't touch it, they can't see it, they're not sure of the fundamentals. Whatever the cause might be, let's see what we can do about taking some of the mystery out of electrical circuits. Electricity, or electron movement, only occurs when there's an imbalance. When the atoms of a particular molecule have either lost or gained an additional electron in their outer ring. That doesn't happen by itself. There has to be an outside force, electromotive force that is, that creates the imbalance in the first place. The most used source of EMF in an automobile is the battery. Here one pole of the battery has an abundance of free electrons while the other has a shortfall. The difference between the two posts is electromotive potential or what we typically call voltage. A battery on the bench does nothing. It has the potential to cause electricity or electron movement, but only if we provide a means to allow the side with an abundance of electrons to get to the side where there's a shortfall. So the first thing we need is a conductor, a path to connect the two sides together. A conductor is any material that has a minimum number of electrons in its outer ring. That makes adding or subtracting an electron from it easier. Copper, Gold and platinum are all examples of atoms with this characteristic, and you are familiar with copper wiring in the cars you've serviced. But what about that molding around the copper? Well, that's an insulator, a material whose atoms have several electrons in the outer ring, making it very difficult, if not impossible, to create the imbalance needed for electrons to flow. No electron flow, remember, means no electricity. Now stringing a copper wire between the two posts of the battery would certainly give us a complete path, wouldn't it? But because there's nothing to inhibit the movement of electrons, all the electrons on one side are going to hurry like hell to get to where there's missing uh, spaces on the other side. And without anything to slow them down, that wire would very quickly overheat and melt. So it'd be kind of a dumb thing to do and potentially dangerous. Don't try this at home. The component that is being operated or doing the work is the heart of an electrical circuit, and it's called the load. Instead, try this for yourself. Take a light bulb and some wire. Connect one end of the light bulb to the positive side of the battery and the other end of the light bulb to the negative side of the battery. It should light up because now you have all basic elements for a complete circuit. You have a source, you have a load, and you have a complete path going to and back from the load. Now, it would be a hassle if we had to plug in the headlights every time we wanted to turn them on. Now, how about something that we can put in the circuit path that would allow that, us to do that a lot easier? Something, I don't know, like uh, a switch. Any device that is used to open and close the circuit path is called a control. You are likely familiar with basic switches. Relays are typically used as control devices, as are control module drivers. Can you think of any others? All the control does is open the path, and that prevents electron movement. Have to have a complete path, remember? Since a control opens or closes the path, it can be installed anywhere in that path, either between the source and the load on the positive side of the circuit, or in the return path from the load back to the source, the ground side of the circuit. Now let's stick in a quick note about the two sides of the circuit path, the positive side, or the part from the source to the load, and the ground side, the part from the load back to the source. On every automotive circuit, the positive side is always a direct wire connection between the source and the electrical component. However, on the ground side, not quite so much. To reduce the amount of wiring, the body itself, even the engine itself, are used as ground points. So just because you've got a good ground for that brake light in the trunk, doesn't mean that that path is complete all the way back up to the battery. What about protection for the wiring? 
What if something happens to the wiring between the source and the load on the positive side of the circuit? And for some reason, it bypasses the load and goes straight back to ground or back to the source. That would be just like the copper wire example I used a little while ago, wouldn't it? There's no restriction to current flow. Flow would go unchecked until something burned. Fuses, fusible links, and circuit breakers are all means to prevent that from happening, and they are called the circuit protection devices. Their function is simple. If electron flow exceeds the design limit, the circuit protection device is responsible for opening the path before any more damage can be done. That is one reason it is imperative that any circuit protection device be replaced with one of the same or lower rating, never higher. Because it protects the positive side of the circuit, circuit protection devices will always be between the source and the load on the positive side of the circuit path. Now let's take a moment to review the elements that make up a complete circuit. A source to provide the electromotive force or potential we need for electrons to flow. A load to perform the actual work we want the circuit to perform. A control that enables us to turn the load on or off by interrupting electron flow. A circuit protection device to protect the circuit from excessive electron flow. A complete path for electron flow to follow that starts and ends at the source. Specifically, this is the description of a series circuit where there's only one path for current to follow. Automotive circuits, for the most part, are combinations of series and parallel circuits or circuits that have more than one path for electrons to follow. For example, one wire may supply the power to all the brake lights and then split off to multiple wires leading to each individual bulb. This will affect current flow but will not affect the basics of having full voltage at the load and a good ground after the load. It can help in your troubleshooting though. If more than one load is affected, look for the problem in those portions of the circuit shared by the load. If the fault is in only one load, then focus your initial testing on that part of the circuit unique to that load. Okay, let's talk a bit about volts, amps, and ohms. Volts, or voltage, is the measurement of electromotive potential in the circuit. That's the force that we need to create the imbalance and get electrons moving. The electron movement itself, that's current flow. And current flow is something that we measure in a value called amps. Now, there has to be some way to control that flow of current through the circuit. And that's done with uh, something called resistance. Resistance is the opposition to current flow, and we measure that in a value called ohms. Now the load in the circuit, that's what we want doing the work, and that is the primary resistance, the controlling factor in the circuit of how much current will flow. Now the connectors, even the wiring itself, pose some resistance, but it should be minimal, it shouldn't really affect the operation of the circuit. If you do, then there's a problem. That's not a good thing, and that's the premise for using voltage drop testing. Ohm's law is a representation of the relationship between electromotive force, electron flow, and restrictions to flow, and it states the relationship between volts, current, and resistance to be voltage equals current times resistance, or volts equals amperage times ohms. I don't care if you ever do the math to figure out what a missing value might be. The important things to learn from Ohm's law can be summed up in two statements. A decrease in voltage will cause a decrease in current flow for any given resistance. An increase in resistance will cause a decrease in current flow for any given voltage. Circuit loads need current to work, and if something affects the amount of current that they're receiving, they were not going to work the way they should or may not work at all. Now a weak battery causes a lowered voltage which causes less current. That's a problem. Increased resistance somewhere in the circuit decreases current and that's also a problem. And how are we going to find these? Simply using voltage drop. Voltage drop is the term used to reference how voltage is used to push across the resistance of a load and create the electron movement. You remember what should be the only primary resistance in the circuit? That's right, the load. 
So you can measure voltage on the positive side of the load and you should read about the same as the voltage potential measured at the source. With the light bulb lit or the load on, now move your positive meter lead to the ground side of the load. It should read darn close to zero volts, but not quite. That's because all the available voltage should be used to overcome the primary resistance, the load, in the circuit. Since there is some very low resistance in the wiring and connections though, you're going to measure a very small amount of voltage. If there are substantial additional sources of resistance, like a bad ground or corroded connection, the available voltage will be split proportionally between the individual resistances and you're going to get a meter reading that will stand out like a red flag. And that's the basis for voltage drop testing. That's a test procedure that you're going to need to master if you want to be sure you'll be able to find all those electrical gremlins. Unfortunately, we're not going to have time to go into that in this edition of the trainer, but stick around. I'll share some links to some resources that will help you master this very important testing skill. Until then, though, thanks for watching. I'll see you next month.